Great. Well, let's get started then. One second here. Hey, um, so good morning, everybody. Um, as Holly's introduced me, my name is Mark Dennis. I work with systems and network training. Um, links and systems and network training have collaborated many times to bring you webinars such as this one. And again, I hope this uh, this morning's session is going to be uh, useful and interesting to you. The subject is reading BTP and routing tables. So um, BGP was first introduced into the internet over 30 years ago, um, first with version one. Um, it's been since upgraded to version four, which we're all on now. And that was actually back in 1994. Um, although we're still on the same version as then, there have been multiple updates, including things like IP version six, classless, interdomain routing, uh, root aggregation, just to name just a few. So BGP is definitely form up, forefront in our in our presentation today. Um, so we'll be going for two hours. We'll have a break halfway through the middle. Um, I would say that this presentation is um, uh, has a sort of a hands on nature to it. Uh, most of what I'm presenting will be in screen cap simply because of uh, time constraints that we have here, but they will be screen captures from, um, you know, actual kind of routing environment. We're talking about BGP and routing tables. So it's only fitting that we should look at BGP and routing tables of routers. Um, the overall aim is to help you to understand BGP and routing and the process around that and how it translates into um, directing traffic flow across the internet. Um, here's an objective slide. Uh, there's a quite a lot of information on here, but uh, I'll just sort of summarize it and say, we're talking about BGP routing tables. So essentially, um, there are two tables of information that routers in the internet have. And um, the routing table is the table the router uses to direct traffic. The BGP table is an accumulation that each router has of information uh, that a router has about its own BGP local routes and information that's been passed on to it from other routers. And if the routes are going to make it from the BGP table into the routing table, the one that's actually used to direct traffic, then there is a sort of selection process that takes place. So um, that's the sort of backdrop of the sort of things that we're going to be talking about in this um, in this presentation today. So let's get started and we will start with the basics, um, which is this first section here, understanding routing tables and their significance in directing traffic flow. So very basically, just to get started, uh, we'll talk about what a router is. A router is a networking device. This networking device makes forwarding decisions based on its routing tables. Okay, remember we said before that information goes from the BGP table into the routing table. And so the router directs traffic based on what's in its routing tables. And a router connects to different network segments, enabling communications between devices on those different network segments. So let's take a look here, um, for example, at this router, and it's got four connections to four different networks. Now, each of the connections that a router has to the networks that it's directly connected to must have an IP address such as we see here. So this, for example, is this interface here, 00, zero and the router has an IP address on that network and it connects it to this network address that's up here. And for this particular router, it has another three interfaces. So it has four interfaces altogether that connect it to four different networks. The consequence of this is that the router will create its own routing table from the networks that it knows about. Now, this router here knows about these four networks because it's directly connected to it. So what does it do? It puts in its routing table the four networks that it knows about. 
and information about how the router gets to those networks. In other words, the interface is associated with the connection to each of those networks. Now, if a router wants to send a packet that it gets, an IP packet that it gets, for example, addressed to this network here, it knows it needs to forward it out of this interface 01. So, you know, that's the essential process here that a router has behind uh, routing. And if we were to look at uh, this router through the eyes of its uh, management interface, we can see, for example, here, those four interfaces, the four IP addresses and the status on those interfaces. And if we look at the routing table, um, we saw a representation in PowerPoint just now, but this is what the routing table for this router would look like. And there's quite a lot of information in this routing table, but there are the actual networks that direct the router and enable it to route packets to a given network. For example, this one here highlighted in red. This says that if you want to send a packet to anything on this network here, then, and that network is directly connected to the router, then send it out of this interface here which is what I've highlighted there. So the router wants to send a packet to this, this network here. And what does it do? It sends it out of gigabit ethernet zero, zero. And each of the other uh, three networks and network directions via its interfaces uh, is populated like this as well. So when a router knows for sure about how to get to a given interface or a given network rather. Um, and it knows that that is that information is definitely the best way to get to a given network. And there's no better way than if the interfaces are, you know, directly connected to the router, then it puts entries in its routing table. These represent the best routes for this router to get to these different networks here. Now you can see there's some other information in here. I'm not going to talk too much about those, but those are as a result of uh, these other references here. These are as a result of the way that the software on the router works. So there's a reference to the particular interface and there's a class will address here as well. Only the routes highlighted in red are what the router will use in order to forward packets to these networks and more specifically devices on those networks. So that's a brief introduction to um, the whole overall routing process of a router. Now we're going to look at how BGP plays a part here. So um, in terms of BGP, what is BGP? Um, BGP is an application that runs on routers. And BGP is an application that enables routers to share information so that a router can learn about networks that are not directly attached to it, as we have just seen. So, for example, here, if I have a router over here and this router is um, connected to some networks, it um, those routes can be shared using BGP with another router over here. So BGP is what we call a routing protocol, and it allows one router to share information about routes that it knows about with another router that it communicates with. And of course, in the grand scale of the internet over here, we have millions of routers in the internet, it's thought. And, um, you know, for example, a router up here in you know Alaska or whatever can can forward information about routes to uh, another router that it's communicating with, and that router can pass that information on over here, and so routes can be sent basically from you know one part of the world to another by the BGP protocol running on routers to exchange information, so routers can learn about routes connected to networks, to, to routers all around the world using this BGP. In the world, we're all using BGP version 4, as I mentioned before. 
So we all have commonality um, and we're going to look at these mechanisms of sharing within BGP as we go through this presentation. Now, a very important part of the way the BGP works is that um, not all of those routers in the internet belong to a given organization. Um, we have multiple um, end user customers. We have content delivery network providers. We have internet service providers. So each of these organizations, and there are about 30,000 of them connected to the internet, um, have their own group of routers, and they group the routers into a sort of an organizational unit called an autonomous system. Now, um, what this allows us to do with BGP is that one group of routers or one router in an autonomous system, for example, here like ISP XYZ, can use BGP to share the routing information that they have with another organization like this customer here or like this ISP over here. And they do this by having a relationship between neighboring routers called peering. And in order for BGP to be able to notify um, another organization about um, where the routes are coming from, let's supposing Router ISP over here wants to notify and send some routes over to ISP ABC over here. It, the um, autonomous system that uh, ISP uses will have a registered number. And that registered number is called an autonomous system number. And it's a 32-bit unique number. And so when ISP ABC uh, sorry, XYZ advertises routes using BGP to ISP ABC. It uses its autonomous number. So in other words, ABC will see the routes coming from ASN. In my case here, I've simplified it. I've just called it ASNB. It will in fact be a 32-bit number, but that's the way I've simplified it. So now we um, can effectively in the internet we can pass routes from one autonomous system number or one autonomous system or one ISP, if you like, to another hop by hop across the Internet. And we can see who is announcing the routes to us and who uh, and where those routes are being passed through. And we'll see some more information about this as we go through. So um, in a nutshell, what I'm saying here is that BGP routers they peer with other routers in order to share routes. And when they do so, they identify the routes they're sharing as where they're coming from with their autonomous system number. A little bit more about BGP. Um, in order for routers in different autonomous systems to be able to uh, share routes, they must strike up a relationship. And this is not done by auto discovery. This is done by someone in autonomous system one specifically configuring the router to communicate with the router in autonomous system two, for example, it, uh, here, and vice versa back in the other direction. They send each other what we call an open packet to open this communication session here. Then they can send each other root, uh, routing packets or update packets. Uh, they can keep this session alive using something called a keep alive. And if there's any problem on the session, they can send each other information about um, notification of any errors. So these are the four different types of packets that BGP can use in order to maintain that relationship in order to be able to pass routes across between autonomous systems across the Internet here. So now let's just look a little bit more closely at how this root advertisement works. So let's say router one is programmed to advertise here a route that it knows about. So let's supposing router one has knows about this network over here, 10, 10, 0, 0, 16. It can now advertise that route to router two. 
And if router two knows about this network over here, 192.168.1.0.24, it can advertise that to router one. This way, router two can learn about this network, which it's not directly connected to, and router one can learn about this network here that it's not directly connected to. In order to get this set up, um, you can see what I've set up in a, in a, in a lab environment here. Uh, let's say we look at router one here. To start configuring BGP on router one, we say router BGP one, for example, this is a, a Cisco syntax of configuration. That starts the BGP process, and the one here says that that BGP process is part of Autonomous System 1, the AS number. Then we have to say what router we want this um, router 1 to go and talk to and strike up a relationship with, uh, peering with, in other words, as we just said. So this command here does that for us. I say neighbor. Um, the address of router 2, we can see that down here, so I give the address here, and I say what autonomous system router 2 is in. Now I have to say to this router, what do you want to advertise in BGP? And this router knows about this route here, so we say to advertise the route, we say network, and then the actual network we want this router to advertise. Now it can advertise that router to router 2. Um, here's a very quick Wireshark capture um, showing you the different types of BGP packets we talked about. The open packet, which is sent in both directions in order to um, have this bi-directional peering between routers. Keep alive to maintain that, um, uh, that relationship, that peering relationship. We can see we've done a reset here. That's what the notification is for that restarts this peering and then update packets you can see them enumerated here in in wireshark if we look a little bit more closely we can see how bgp does this advertisement so here we're looking at this router router 2 and we're capturing the packets that are going across from router 2 to router 1 when it advertises this route that we just mentioned. And we can see here that this uh, packet is going from router 2, that's the address here, 172.16.1.2, to 172.16.1.1, that's router 2 to router 1. It's an update message, and here is the route that's being advertised. We put it here, and that's what Wireshark sees as well. Now router 1, will learn that routing, uh, will learn that route, and it may go into its routing table so that if it gets a packet for this network, it will be able to send it towards the router that advertised the route to it. Similarly, if we went back the other way, router one is advertising with an update message, the network that it knows about. Okay, so we can actually see these advertisements in the update packets by means of Wireshark. Now, let's take a look at the routing tables of the routers having received the routes that were just advertised. So over here, we've got the routing table of router one. Router two over, over here has advertised the 192.168.1 network and that has made it now into the routing table of router one. It's not directly connected, but it's learned about that route via BGP, the BGP update from router two. And here's the network. Um, and it says that it learned it via 172.16.1.2, which is the address here of router two. It learned that route via router two and it's now gone into its BGP table, and we can see it's a BGP route because it's got a B on there. Now, that entry in the routing table will allow this router to send packets to this remote network because of that advertisement. And similarly, 
uh, router one advertises the 10 network the other way. We're looking at the routing table of router B here, and we can see that entry has gone into its table and it's learned it via 172.16.11, which is router one over here. So that's the result in that very simple setup of BGP advertising routes between those routers. Now, let's talk a little bit more about some of the details behind the scenes. So BGP is what we call a path vector protocol. And a path vector protocol means that um, the information about where the route is coming from and the path to get to that route is advertised in these updates that we've just seen. So as opposed to a distance vector routing protocol like RIP, which is a very old protocol now, it just advertises the network and, and a metric is how far away that network is, but we don't know the path to get there. In BGP, we do, and that gives BGP routers, routers running BGP, a lot more information about um, the path to get to a given prefix. And if it has multiple paths to get there, which path it will, can determine to be the best one. And that means we can do a lot more things like traffic engineering with something like BGP, because we can use metrics like the, the path vector to determine um, the best path to get to a given prefix. So in this example here, router A is advertising this network and it advertises it to its peer in autonomous system two up here, this router. When it advertises that network, it advertises its own AS, as I mentioned before. Now, this router can then pass that route on to this router here and that router which is peering with this router in autonomous system three can pass that route on again. When it does so, it passes on the information about the fact that this route has come through ASN2, but it still passes on the information about where that route came from, which is ASN1. So it not only advertises the route, but it advertises the whole path to that route for ASN3. ASN3 then passes the route on to ASN4, and similarly, it adds its own AS number in here. Now, when the route is received by router F down here in ASN4, it sees, ah, the originator of this route was ASN1, and the route passed through ASN2 and ASN3 to get to me. And so it can see the path trail that it would need to go through to send a packet to something on that network here. That's the vector, if you like, in the name path vector protocol, which is what BGP is. So um, we're now gonna start looking at the BGP table and um, not only the the, the AS path, the, the, the ASN hops that are, a route goes through with BGP, but we're going to look at some of the other path attributes that BGP has as well to understand um, uh, how BGP does its routing and the sort of information that a router can use to determine the best route to use and the best route to put into its routing table. So um, the sort of thing that we're going to see in BGP tables, um, these path vectors, um, not just the AS path that we've just seen, we're going to see uh, the next hop IP address in our route, in our BGP table. And we're also going to see um, other path vectors or other route preferences, if you like. And if a router um, in a much more complex setup than we've seen so far, has multiple paths to get to a given root prefix. It can use this information in here to determine which is the best path. 
Remember, it's the best path that goes into the routing table. The BGP table can offer multiple paths because of you know, root advertisements, root updates from potentially several different interconnected uh, peer routers. But it's the best path that needs to be determined by this router so that when it wants to get to a prefix, it knows should it choose path A, should it choose path B, or if there are more paths, which one should it choose? So it's going to make some decisions around, for example, um, the shortest AS path. One of the kind of the default um, the default uh, routing best path selection criteria in BGP is to find the route with the shortest AS path. We've just seen an AS path of up to three ASs. Um, if there was a, an optional path with two ASs, the chances are the router would choose that path because it's shorter. But there are some other path attributes as well that come into play and also in the decision process are some kind of overriding factors that a, a router admin can use to determine um, how the router uh, makes its path selection as well. So let's just have a quick look at a very simplified BGP table. We can see some here in our simplified setup that we were looking at just now. So we're looking at the BGP table here of router two, not the routing table, the BGP table, and we're looking at the BGP table of router one here. And the first entry that I've highlighted on both is the local route entry. So let's take, for example, router one here. The admin of router one has gone into the configuration and made a configuration statement to say that this router will advertise into BGP the network for this local IP address. This is the interface of the actual router on this local network. And so the administrator uh, determines that this router will advertise the 10.10.0016 network. And um, as such, it goes into the BGP table and it goes into the BGP table with a 0000, 000 next hop because it's local. It's not one router hop away. And if we go over here to some of these path metric um, fields here, there's not actually a number in the path field. There's only an I. And the I is what we call the origin. The origin determines that this route was added by the administrator locally. Same over here with router two. This router has had by the admin the local network added um, 192.68.10.000 for next hop because it's a local route and there's no AS path number shown here in the path details because again, it's local. The second route, however, is the one that was received from the other router in the BGP update announcement. So if we look at router one here, router one has learned and put into its BGP table the route learned from router two. And so it adds in here the fact that router two announced that route to it. Its next hop is 172.16.12. And now, as well as the I, because it was generated by the admin in router two, we can see the path the AS path two being advertised um, from router two to say that this, um, this route has come from AS two over here. And similarly, router two has the 1010 network from router one's next hop and the AS one as the originating path. That's what's seen in the table in this situation here. There's just some highlights that I jump through my explanation there. So what's happened here is this. Router 2 has advertised the route with its AS path to Router 1. Router 1 has advertised the route with its path to Router 2. And if we go in and have a look at what happened by, again, using Wireshark on this interlink here, we can see um, 
when router two advertised to router one, the network and the path, there's a path attribute in the update packet carrying that information about AS path two. That's how router one over here receives the update and knows that that route came from AS two. Now, we can also see here there are another a number of other root path attributes, um, including the origin, that's where the I came from, the next hop, and something in this case called the, uh, the med or multi-exit discriminator. We'll talk a little bit about that later on, but there are a number of additional path attributes that routers can also send each other, and those add numbers to the, the BGP tables and those factors associated with the route in the BGP table are what the router uses to choose um, to determine the best route to put into its routing table. Okay, let's just take time here. Okay, we're good for time. All right, so let's have a look um, at this setup. We've seen it before. Um, when the route finally gets, uh, when the route is advertised from router A and goes through this path here and finally gets to router F, router F from the update and the AS path information, we just saw in a simple setup uh, in Wireshark, but this is what the Wireshark would have captured here. Router F can see for this routing update, it can see the path information. It knows it has to go all that way back as we described before, if it wants to send a packet to that um, to that uh, network. Now, what do you think would happen if we added another link in here? In other words, we change the topology. And when we change that topology, we start to advertise or router A now starts to advertise um, this route it knows about down this path to router F. Surely now router F in ASN4 will have two different paths that it can send the packet down, a, a shorter path and a longer path as well. Well, let's go and take a look and see what happens here. First of all, when router A advertised the route, someone, the admin, has to go into router A and say a statement such as this. I want you to advertise network 1010 with a mask of um, 255, That starts the route advertisements from the point of view of router A. If initially this link is not here, this second link that I added in just now is not here. If we go over to router F and have a look at its um, BGP table, there's only one route here, so it's quite simple to look at. This is the BGP table of router F. You can use this command to see it. We can see that router F has received a network 10, 10, 0, 0, slash 16, the one we just advertised from router A. The next hop is 172.16.71. That's router E here. So the route has basically gone round here in its advertisement. This, so router A has passed it on to router B because it's peering. Router B is peering with router C. It's passed it on there. Router C to D, D to E, and then E has passed it on to F. Remember, this link is not here yet. And when we have a look here, so we see the next hop is router E for our router down here. And when we have a look at the path, we can see the path now is three, two, one. The AS on the right-hand side is the origin, ASN one here for router A. And then it goes through two, and then it comes down here to three. So one, two, three, or three, two, one is the way it's written. And it's an I because, as we just saw, the admin in this router added the route to tell 
this router to start advertising the route in BGP. So that's what that will look like before we add this second link in. And if we were to have a look in Wireshark, there we go, we can see the route being advertised. So we're basically capturing on the incoming port to router F. And if we go and have a look at the path attributes here, we see the path attribute of 321, we see the next hop of router E, and we see the I for IGP, uh, the IGP read, the, which, which means I, it means the root origin was added by the administrator in uh, this case, autonomous system one. So that's what all that looks like. Now we add this route in, or this network in here, this link between A and F. And once that's there, router A is going to start to advertise the route down this path because it's peering now with router F. We have a look at the BGP table of router F, and we can see the same network, this time with a different next hop, 172.16.21, which you can see the network here, 172.20, that's the interface of router A. So router F's next hop to get to this prefix via this path is router A. And if we look at the path information here now, we just see AS1 in here. Now that is absolutely right, it is the best path, but we might expect to see the longer path in the BGP table as well. Why, it's, why isn't that longer path there? Okay, so we've added a link in, and now the BGP table for router F has completely changed and it's lost effectively the longer path. We've just got this path that we just described. Well, let's have a look at what happened here. So when we added this link in, an interesting thing happened. There was an update packet here that went from router E to router F. Router E sent a root update to router F when this link was added in. And this update says that the root 1010016 -10 has been withdrawn. So router E was announcing the route previously to router F, but once this link went in, router E withdrew the route. Question is why? To understand why, we have to look at the BGP table of router E here. So if we do that, we can see that router E has two entries for the 10, 10, 0, 0, 16 network, one via next top 72, 172.16.72, which is router F. So router E can get to the network over here via router F now because of this new link. It can also get to the network via 172.16.61, which is router D. So router E can go this way or this way to get to that network. And both have the same length path. However, the preferred path is the one via router F. Now I'll talk about why it's preferred in just a second. In BGP, if you are advertising a route to a peer and that peer is your best path to get to the route. So previously, E was advertising the route to F to say, come and get to you know um, the network the long way round. As soon as we put this link in, E has now, this route here has now determined that F is the best path to get to this network. In BGP, that will mean that E will no longer advertise to F the longer way round because F is the best way for E to get to the network. So in BGP, you don't advertise a route to your peer who is your best path to get to a given prefix. And that's why the route was withdrawn here. Second part of the question is, why did 
router E, choose the top path here as the best. How do we know it's the best? We know it's the best because of this greater than sign here. The greater than sign tells us, reading this BGP table, that that is the best path to get to this prefix. The other one is an alternate path. And the reason is this I here. OK, this I indicates that for router E, this prefix was learned from this next hop, which is router D. It learned about it using IBGP. And this path via 172.16.72 via router F, it learned about it via EBGP. So the difference here is that EBGP is when you're peering with a router in a different autonomous system. IBGP is when you're peering with a router in the same autonomous system. EBGP beats IBGP. And um, after the break, we're going to have a look at uh, various different metrics in routing and which um, the kind of the order in which these factors tell the router when there are multiple options, which um, of these root preferences and options like IBGP or EBGP are the best ones. And those, that kind of hierarchical list is the way that routers choose the best routes to put into their routing table. So that's what's gone on here. This is the best prefix. This is an alternate one, but um, the best one is the top one that's been chosen. And um, that's how it's made its choice in this case. So it's withdrawn the route from router F in the other direction. OK, so I want to summarize, really, or just highlight um, and talk about the different um, types of path metrics that routers have. Um, and then when we come back after the break, we're going to look at how we can, um, how those different path metrics have an impact on, um, you know, the, the the selection criteria of the router to determine which are the best paths when there are more than one entry for a prefix in its routing table. So first of all, um, here we see the the the, the, the Wireshark breakout of a BGP update packet again. Uh, we can see the origin type again. We can see the AS path. We can see the next hop. Those three uh, path attributes are mandatory, and they're always sent with BGP updates. Every single router that's running BGP will use those. There are also some optional um, BGP path metrics that may be included in routing updates. Um, and if they are, they can also have a... Uh, a strong determining effect on the selection criteria of a router to choose between you know the best options when multiple path options exist only one of these is going to go into the routing table the one that gets the greater than sign is the best route and that's the one that will be chosen to go into the routing table when the router wants to route to this prefix here okay so how does the router determine which is the best route from various routes in its BGP table. That's what these options are here for. And then also we have, uh, it's not really a path um, attribute as such, but we have a decision criteria of EBG versus IBGP. We just said that EBGP is the one that wins. And we can also do some uh, route manipulation with things like uh, aggregation as well. So these ones are, mandatory there's also some additional optional ones and they determine how the router chooses the best paths from the bgp table over here overall um the process of and nature of bgp um updates um, has some characteristics that we should probably mention as well while we're at this point. So um, 
first of all, the second point here, BGP only sends incremental updates. So in other words, it will only send information about specific routes that have changed since the last update. So the first time you bring up routers, there's big changes. They will announce all their routes to each other. If there are changes in the network, like we simulated with that additional link, then there'll be updates sent to notify the routers about those updates, and that will change the look and feel of the BGP tables as we saw, and that will obviously impact as well the routing tables as a result of that. So topology changes or change-driven updates would include topology changes, configuration changes, and withdrawal of routes if links go away, or based on the rule we just said, you don't advertise a route to um, a router, which is your best path to a route. Um, there are periodic updates, but they're not routing updates, they're just keeper lives. So with BGP, it sends keeper lives between routers in order to maintain this peering relationship. And um, BGP can use the loss of those keeper lives to determine that that peer is no longer there. And it can use that to then obviously make topology changes and route withdrawals, etc. But it's probably true uh, these days that um, the keep alive timers are relatively slow and other techniques like BFD uh, also come into play here to for BGP to recognize topology changes. We, we don't really have time to talk about those things here. Um, and then there are also uh, factors like selective route advertisement, which means you don't necessarily always advertise everything to your peers. You'll have a policy that determines whether you want to send advertisements to, to peers or not, um, because there may be some sort of you know, rules uh, around that. And you can use, as you can see here, root filters to, to um, determine some of those situations. So changes in BGB advertisements will change the BGP tables, and that will, of course, impact the routing tables because we're always going to take the best routes from the BGP table to go into the routing table. And those may change based on some of the changes we just um, discussed here. So, um, you know, root addition and withdrawal, BGP updates, uh, as a result of these, will change the look and feel of the BGP table. And that's going to potentially change the routing table. And therefore, because the routing table is the way the router actually determines the way packets go, that can have an impact. Um, it can have an impact if you make configuration changes or, um, you know, there are other changes which mean that the path selection criteria have now changed as well. That can also um, impact the, the routing table. Um, link failures or route changes will generate BGP updates and routers will need to quickly go through the selection criteria in the BGP table in order to um, determine which are now, you know, the best routes or have they changed and therefore make changes to their routing tables accordingly. Now, if there are flapping changes in your network, then, um, you know, where a link comes up and goes back down again because of some sort of cable or interference issue or component issue, then, you um, there are some techniques like dampening, for example. Not many people tend to use that. But what you don't want is your network fluctuating all the time. You want some stability. So then you can bring in some filtering techniques like error disable, for example, to permanently take links down to make sure you try and keep a stable environment uh, uh, as much as possible. So. Um, Overall, um, there are many factors that determine or are used to determine the, the, the best um, routes within BGP. And BGP allows network administrators to uh, implement policies uh, governing the advertisement and propagation of routes. 
And it's by manipulating those routes and applying filters and configuring route distribution, et cetera, that administrators can control which routes go into their routing table and thereby control how traffic gets directed um, by those routing table entries in their routers. Um, you can do this for optimization, you can do this for load balancing, you can do this for stability. Now, you know, what you advertise out to other routers and what they accept in terms of your route advertisements is at the end of the day up to the individual ISP or AS organizations, but clearly a coordinated approach to route changes and to advertisements um, that affect the way that, you know, uh, different ASs route traffic between each other is, is probably the, the best approach to take. Um, I think we've come to the kind of at the end of that first section there. That's what I wanted to say. Um, and uh, in the second section, after the break, we'll look at some uh, techniques for route manipulation that we've just got to mention here. But were there any questions um, about what we've covered so far? Yes, there was. So question, how does the router decide which routes in the BGP table are chosen to go into the routing table? OK, well, that's great. That's a great question. Thank you. Um, so we haven't seen some of the detail yet. Uh, we've seen, um, for example, in the context of that question, um, we've seen some criteria with the AS path, for example. So the, the route is going to compare the metrics in the BGP attributes that it sees in the in the BGP table, and it's going to use various decision criteria. So, for example, um, shortest path, shortest AS path might be one criteria, or we've seen an example of, for example, where uh, it prefers the IBG, so the EBGP path over the IBGP path, um, and we will be uh, looking at various other metrics in the second half that will kind of add a bit more explanation to what we just talked about there as well. So thank you. Thank you for that question. Hello and welcome back everybody from the break. So Mark, before we jump into it, we have another question. So I have three ASNs with a slash 19 prefixes. Does this mean I can advertise the prefixes through any of the ASNs? How does this affect what I registered in my IRR database? Okay, so um, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, depends. The, the answer really is depends on where you got those um, uh, addresses from. So uh, if you, for example, are issued a slash 19 from service provider A, um, or, you know, service provider be behind, let's say, one of the ASNs, we call it service provider A, then um, usually you're not allowed to advertise that prefix to another service provider. Okay, so you have to be very careful about that. It depends on where you got them from, though. If those prefixes were assigned by the Internet Registry themselves, so they're provider independent addresses, then you're allowed to advertise those uh, provider independent addresses through um, any of the ASNs or any of the providers that you're connecting to. How does this affect what you register in the IRR database? So when you take your um, prefixes and you register them in the database, then uh, though you're, uh, you know, you're permitted to advertise those uh, in the same way according to the same rules that we just talked about just now. Hopefully that answers the question. So it really depends on who's issuing the, the addresses as to the uh, the provide or the ASNs that you're allowed to advertise those addresses into. Perfect. Thanks, Mark. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, if we're ready to go on, I'll share my screen again here. Yep, that's working. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Okay, so going back into um, um, 
our presentation here. We're going to look at um, uh, more about deciphering the BGP tables and in the context of the information that can be in the BGP tables to help us to optimize our network um, uh, our network direction of, of IP packets. So here we can see just a breakdown of um, the, the, the router uh, BGP table that we looked at in the previous example, that was router E. Um, and most of these things should be familiar to you by now, but I just wanted to highlight them out before we go any further. So um, the I here on the left-hand side in this uh, Cisco-based routing table, uh, which is the one I'm kind of most familiar with, refers to the fact that it's uh, a route that was received from a peer using uh, an update using IBGP as an update. In other words, the peer is in my own um, autonomous system. This is the destination prefix. Um, the next hop here is the hop which is being advertised to us or to this router in this case router e from the um in the routing update so in the routing update is this path attribute called routing called next hop uh in terms of ebgp the next hop is usually your actual peer but as we'll see in a moment, in the case of IBGP, that's not always the case. So it doesn't necessarily mean the next router that you need to go through to get to the prefix. Uh, and more, we'll see more on this in just a second. The metric uh, column is for uh, multi-exit discriminator. We'll be talking about that. Local preference, we'll be talking about that. These are metrics that can be used to influence the way that um, traffic uh, is sent to and received from uh, neighboring ASs. Um, Cisco has something called wait, which can be used by a local router, but we don't send this in routing updates. So uh, I'm not specifically going to be talking about this here. Then we see the paths, the ASs that are traversed um, in order to get to the prefixes, and then the origin code, which we mentioned before. So I want to just um, look here at, again, a little bit more at the AS path attribute. We've seen it already. We know that when a prefix is advertised, it's advertised with the um, AS of the origin AS that's advertising it. So in this case, this is a 10 slash 8 prefix with AS1. That will then get passed on potentially by the receiving routers in AS2. AS2 adds its path to the, the, the path attribute. Um, that then gets passed on by three, and that gets that also adds its path in the path, path attribute here. Now, um, as well as being used to provide a vector in terms of um, the actual path taken, to get to a prefix, which is what this path attribute provides here. It's also used to prevent loops in networks. Now, should AS4 here um, uh, pass this information in back to AS1, then AS1 will see its own AS being advertised to it and see that effectively its update has been looped back to itself. So it will drop this. In a slightly different situation, if uh, and, and therefore that uh, uh, avoids a, loop, uh, a routing loop here um, in effect. So AS4 is not going to, um, hopefully not going to pass the packet back to AS4 uh, AS1, but if it does, then the packets will be dropped uh, and, and not looped. But base, going back to what we were saying before, if AS1 was also advertising the path to AS4 here, then quite clearly for AS4, the best path to go, it would have two paths now, the long way round or the short way round, in which case the short path would represent the best route. So 
the route that is being passed on to it via AS3, the, the less good route, the, the longer path here, would not be advertised by AS4 to AS1 because of the rule that we mentioned before, you don't pass on a route to um, your best path um, peering neighbor. So just to, just to um, keep this in mind. Now, I wanted to um, just kind of provide a summary here of the selection criteria. And this kind of answers the, the question that we had before the break was how does a router determine what the best path is? Um, and there are these sort of eight major selection criteria um, that a, a, a router uses. So um, first of all, from the top, we have the uh, next hop attribute. Now, with BGP, there is a, depend a, a big dependency on next hop and whether the route being received or the update being received in BGP will actually even make it uh, and be selected to go into the routing table. We've seen the next top attribute. Uh, we saw it on the previous slide in the BGP table. So when a router receives uh, an update in BGP, it will make it into the BGP table and the next hop attribute will be put in there alongside the prefix. But in order to be eligible for that route to go into the routing table, the next hop that's being advertised must already be known to the router. So if the next hop is not known, the route being advertised in the update will not actually make it into the routing table in the first place. So this is very key, and we'll see an example of this um, in a little while where um, uh, this, this comes into play. Um, we're going to look at some of these in, in more detail just jumping down to uh, route no, uh, number four here, this is fairly explanatory. A router will always prefer its own route rather than one that's being advertised to it. And also if a route is being advertised back to a router, which is its own route, then of course that will probably be dropped anyway because um, of the, the looping situation that we talked about just now. We've only seen here, and we'll probably only see in our environment, the um, the IGP origin code. Um, there are three codes, one of which is kind of extinct and no longer available, but still kind of considered in the code of routers for some reason. Um, but there is an alternative to the I. Remember, the I is where the administrator has added the route locally in the configuration and said, BGP, please announce this route for me. There is another way for um, uh, the origin of a route to be made by a specific router, and that is if the route is being redistributed. So if it's being redistributed as a static route or from another dynamic routing protocol like OSPF, for example, or a loopback interface, um, any of the above, then um, it is seen under the origin code as incomplete. And instead of an I has a question mark associated with it. And in terms of routing preference, the I is preferred over the question mark. So normally that wouldn't be something that you would perhaps uh, consider locally, but if you're being advertised routes from two different locations, for example, um, or by two different methods from a location, then you're going to prefer the I, um, the one which was specifically added uh, over the one where the route has come via a redistribution method. Um, by means of explanation of local preference, let's take a look at an example here. So router X on the right hand side is advertising this prefix. And that prefix gets advertised by root peering and it arrives over here in AS1 um, in router B and router C, which are peering over here with these autonomous systems. So root, ad, root updates have made their way over and these routes are now known to router B and router C. Now, router B is then configured by the administrator 
to announce that route internally. And to announce that route internally with a local preference, say, of 200. OK, so this is an administrative task has taken place. The route won't naturally have local preference in it. In fact, local preference can't be used, for, for example, here between AS2 and AS1, because local preference is not sent in EBGB updates. It's just sent internally using IEBGB updates. So router A is a peer of router B, and router B is sending this route to router A and saying, you can get to this prefix, and I'm assigning 200 to the local preference. Router C is doing the same, and it's assigning 100 to the local preference. What that will do to router A, if there's a representation of router A's BGP table here, it'll say that router A can get to this prefix by two different routes. First of all, via router B, which goes kind of this way across the network, and secondly, via router C, which will go this way across the network. And one of them is going to be chosen to go into the routing table, the one which is preferred. Now, in this case, the one that gets preferred is the one that's going to route packets to that prefix and without any other modifications that we see in the graphic here, the one that gets preferred is router B because of the higher local preference. So higher local preference means that this AS can prefer to send the packets via this path, albeit that that path, of course, is actually longer. So the path would be two, three, and five, versus if it went by router C, it would be four and five. So it's a short, it's a longer path, but router uh, local preference overrides AS path length. And that comes down again to this order of criteria that we mentioned before, where the highest, uh, the top of the list was superior over the uh, the, attributes lower down the list. MED can be used in the context of trying to um, influence the way that you want um, a neighboring AS to send you traffic here, uh, send you traffic. So in the example here, AS2 is using the MED attribute in its BGP updates to AS1 to influence the path used by AS1 when sending packets to um, this prefix over here is the one in our example again. So let's say the administrator of AS2 um, configures router X here um, to send this prefix out to its peer router B, but send it with a med value or a metric value of 200. And the administrator of the same AS2 configures router Y to send an update out to router C with a med value of 100. Now, router B and router C receive those updates. They send IBGP updates to their internal router A. And router A then builds its BGP table. And it can see there were two paths in its BGP table to this prefix, one to router B, one via router B that is being seen with a metric or a med of 200. So when router B receives this route advertisement here, it passes on the route and it passes on the med value. So A router A sees those med values and hence the med values appear in its routing in its BGP table. And also the other route is via router C down here, and that has a med value of 100. So one of those routes could make it into the routing table so that when a packet comes into router A for that prefix, for that network, it's going to choose one of them. And it chooses the path via router C because it has the lowest metric or the lowest med. So in this way, basically, AS2 can say to AS1, I would like you to, you know, direct traffic to me um, via this path as opposed to this path here. And it could do that for all sorts of different reasons. Um, 
uh, you know, including financial reasons, um, you know, bandwidth constraints on the other link or whatever it is. But this is enabling ASs to modify the paths taken for incoming traffic. So overall, um, these engineering um, uh, policies allow the you know the bgb table information to implement traffic engineering policies by influencing these metrics that are in our bgb tables there are other metrics as well there are other attributes like you know communities etc uh, we don't have time to go into all of them but if we manipulate the bgb attributes like we've seen here with local preference med as path etc we can influence selection um of paths and we can control traffic so um you know in multi-home networks for example like we just saw we can you know engineer the traffic optimize the traffic flow in particular directions by um modifying those path attributes when they're sent or when they're when when routes are being received by it by our AS from updates from other autonomous systems. And we can also use root um, uh, filtering to um, decide whether we are going to um, advertise routes to our peer ASs or, or not. So in the context here of peering and transit, when ASs are peering with each other, they really should only be and will only be sending each other's customers routes to each other, not upstream routes that coming that are coming from an upstream AS in the internet. Uh, whereas when we're uh, peering with a transit provider, we're going to be sending you know our customer routes up to them, and we're going to be receiving um, perhaps a full internet of routes downstream or all of the internet routes that our upstream provider is able to give us. So we're going to add to the the um, the advertisements control based on who it is we're peering with um, in the internet. So um, to summarize, uh, and we're going to use a sort of this demonstration environment now where we have an AS down here, AS3, and it's connected to two upstream um, ASs here. We're going to take a look at some of the uh, techniques that we can use uh, with live sort of screen caps um, in our demo environment to show you what can what can be done to engineer uh, routes to influence the um, the content of BGP tables and therefore routing tables as a consequence and therefore packet direction as a consequence. As a, as a summary of what we just talked about uh, in terms of some of these metrics, the shortest AS path is preferred, the highest local preference is preferred and local preference has a higher value than AS path length, as we mentioned. Um, the lowest med is preferred and we prefer the origin IGP over the incomplete or redistributed um, origin and as well as that we can use root aggregation um, to modify the behavior of root advertisements as well so if we look at our setup here and we look at the bgp table of router f down here and we look in particular at this prefix in the bgp table so this is the BGP table of router F. In our setup, we're out announcing a number of different networks. Um, the 192.168.11 network is being advertised by router C up here. We can see this network. Um, the router itself has this interface on this network, and this router has been programmed to advertise um, this prefix and as far as router F is concerned, the best path to this prefix, the one that has the greater than sign, as we can see here, is the path via 
next hop 172 16 21 now where's that well first of all it says it's an ibgp route so it must have been received from its ibgp peer which is router a over here because it's got an i here saying it's an ibgp received route but the next hop is not actually that router the next hop is 20.1 which is this router router c up here so what's happened here is the route has been advertised from C to A um, with the next hop of C. And then A has passed that route on in IBGP and not changed the next hop, not used itself as the next hop. So the route or the, the update is received by F with the next hop still of route to C. Now, one of the things we mentioned before was that in order for that route, even though it's the best as far as the BGP table is concerned, in order for that route to go into the routing table, this next hop must be known about via router F. So router F must have an entry in its routing table already for this next hop, for router C's IP address. If not, then this BGP table entry cannot be used. So again, a router will put a receive route into its BGP table, but it can't then be selected to go into the routing table unless the next hop for that BGP announcement is actually known about. And then finally, we can see over here that the path is one. So sure enough, that route has come from AS1 directly to AS2. There's no other ASs in the path. And so that's the way that this route has been received over here. And if we look in the routing table for the next hop address, the 172.21 is the interface. The network is 172.16.20. We can see that entry in router F's routing table. And it's been received via 172.16.11. So this next hop route, we said the router must have down here, is being received from 172.16.11, which is router A. So router A is announcing this next hop route for router F, and therefore it does have an entry in the routing table, and therefore that BGP table entry can make it into the routing table as well. And how has it learned it? It's learned it via OSPF. So we can see that there's an interplay here between the routing table and the BGP table. Um, and because of this um, requirement that we're not going to use a route that we don't know the next hop about. But we so what's happening basically here is we're using OSPF between these two routers to announce, um, you know, effectively next hop routes between them. And therefore, that BGP route can make it into the routing table. And if we look for 192.168.11 in the routing table, um, we can see it down here as this BGP route here. We could have also modified the configuration on router A to announce itself as the next hop rather than just pass the next hop information attribute through which is what we said happened so there is a configuration capability to do this as well okay so if we go back to um router f and the bgb table on router f for this particular prefix the best route for this is via 172.16.21 which is this next top up here it's got the greater than sign and it's used in the BG and the routing table. The path is one, as we mentioned before, and there's the route in the routing table, as we said before. The other thing I wanted to point out, however, is though that the route in the routing table gets an admin distance in this case, specifically because the route was received by IBGP. And that Admin distance can also be used to as a way to compare if it found out this route um, via some other means. But when we see in the Cisco router anyway, a BGP 
um, root with an admin distance of 200, that signifies that the root was learned by IBGP. It can be modified, but that's the default. So if we look in the table and see that, then that's what that is indicated here to us. Okay, so we know the path to 192.168.11 is preferred um, via um, this hop across here. There is another path though, and that path is 192.68.52. And that's this path here. So if we have a look at the whole route here, 192.68.52 is available by AS2 and then AS1. So this path is being advertised by router D to router F. So obviously router C is advertised the router, router D, and then D has passed that on to router F. It's the longer path. So despite this one here, being an IBGP route, it's chosen because the shorter path, the shorter AS path is preferred over the longer AS path, okay, albeit being an IBGP route. But if we wanted to modify this, there are different ways that we can modify these this AS path comparison relationship and cause, for example, the longer route that we see now to be chosen over the original IBGP route. So if, for example, we wanted to advertise a route um, from uh, uh, to modify the route from route to C up here, if this was a service provider, if they wanted to modify the path that they're advertising um, to make it less desirable, then they can use something that we call um, AS prepending. So AS prepending um, is where you're adding a longer path via the AS path metric. So the example here is um, that router C is going to add prepending to this route in order to make this route less desirable um, and get the routers in router uh, in AS3 to use this other path in order to get to it. And it might do that for any number of reasons, commercial or engineering, but we're just going to look at the technique with which this can be done. And what we're showing you here is um, a technique used in Cisco called route maps. And the route map here we've called append AS. And what it's going to do is it's going to add two additional AS1s to the path being advertised. Now, the path was originally advertised down here with just AS1 in the path. If we add two additional ones, then the path will become 1, 1, 1, and therefore make it a, effectively look like a three hop, three AS hop path to the receiving router and make that path less desirable. So that's what we're going to do here, okay? And the outcome of doing this is that now, when we take a look at router F, the path to get to this prefix is now, the, the in fact, the only path to get to this prefix is via two and one, via the AS that's up here, and then via the origin AS. This path that it was using is no longer in the table. And again, that's because some routes have been withdrawn here. So let's take a look at what has happened. If we look at router A and the BGB table of router A here, we'll see that router A has two paths to get to this prefix. One via the 172.16.1.2 path, which is via router F, and it's chosen that as the best route. And that path has a length of two and one. So basically the local prefix, uh, the, the path would be jump across here to router F, then go up to router D, which is in AS2. That's the first one. And then jump across here to um, router C, which is in AS1. 
The other path, 172.16.21, is via this uplink here, and that now has a path of 111 because of the prepend. So that path has been made longer by, by the announcing ISP and made this path now much less desirable. And the reason that the longer path is no longer in router F is because as far as router A is concerned now, router A F is the next hop to the best path, which is what we saw here. There's the route, there's the best next hop. That address is router F. So router A has again withdrawn the route from router F. Um, it keeps both routes in its table, but it no longer announces that route um, to router F because router F is its best path. So making that prepend change has effectively caused um, AS3 to send its traffic for the prefixes being announced by the AS up here using this uplink instead of using this uplink here. Now that's kind of out of the control of this AS down here, unless it wants to, you know, filter and drop those announcements that's been that have been sent to it or modify those announcements. But you know, um, this is kind of one of the ways that ASs can coordinate traffic direction between them. Now, the next method is via local preference. So again, if we go back to how we were before, we go back to the starting point, we've removed that prepend and we look at the BGP table of router F. And once again, router F is going back to this prefix, the same one we saw before via its IBGP neighbor with a path of one. But now if we want to control within this AS, so imagine this is a customer AS and they're connected to two upstream routers here, for example. Um, if they want to control locally, which of the uplinks they want to use, at the moment router F is going to send traffic to this network via this path. But if it wants to modify that, then local preference can be used within this AS to modify the outgoing direction of, of traffic from within this AS itself. So the administrator of, uh, uh, of AS3 can go into router F and create some modifications here. And what it's going to do in the router F config is it's again going to use the root map construct down here and a root map called set LP for set local preference. And it's going to set the local preference to 300. So the 300 is above the default value of 100. Uh, and we know that higher local preferences create preferential order within the BGB table for selection into the routing table. So this suggests that we're trying to do some preference here. And then we're applying that root map to, um, to this neighbor here, the 192.68.5.2 neighbor. We're applying that root map here by setting the local preference on incoming routes. And that's what I've shown you over here. So uh, 5.2 is this neighbor. When this neighbor advertises routes to us on router F, we're going to take those routes and we're going to advertise them to ourselves and internally to our IBGB neighbor, can't see them at the moment, with a local preference of 300 to effectively make this outbound route to that prefix better than the original outbound route on the left hand side. So the effect of doing this now is going to be seen in the BGB table. This is router A. This is the one on the right hand, on the left hand side here. It's received the route. So the route was sent, 
via uh, router C to router D, came down to router F. Router F modified the local preference and announced the route internally in IBGP, remember local preferences for internal route advertisements. And router A now has a record in its table that says, if you want to get to 192.168.11, if you go via 172.16.12, which is router F, then there is a local preference of 300 on that route. It has a path of 2.1, which is longer than the other path here via 172.16.21, which is basically directly up here towards router C. But despite the fact that that's a longer path, the local preference overrides that longer path because local preference trumps um, long paths. So now router A is going to send traffic this way, the long way round, to get to that network. And now, so that's something that we can engineer here in the local AS for it to do that. And we can ver verify that in the BGP, sorry, in the router table of um, router A. The routing table has a BGP route for that prefix. Um, it has an IBGP administrative distance of 200. We can read from the 200 there. And it's via 172.16.12, which is router F. So we've manipulated the routes there to make the traffic go the longer way round. Now, um, route aggregation. So this effectively is kind of like the question uh, that we had uh, just after the break, where um, um, this AS down here has an aggregate prefix of 172.16.32.0 slash 19. Um, and um, it's got two routers, router A connected to router C, router B connected to router D. Now, if this AS um, effectively owns that prefix or was issued this prefix from the internet registry, then it's allowed to advertise it to both of these AS's up here. Um, uh, these AS, these, these addresses are, are not um, provider dependent, in other words. They are they're kind of independent of the provider and you can swap providers and you can take those addresses with you. Now, in order to create some sort of load balancing upstream and control the way traffic um, is um, being advertised and therefore traffic coming back down to AS1, then, um, but still provide some redundancy, then what's going on here is that router A is being used not only to advertise the aggregate, but also to advertise a more specific route to uh, 172.16.32.20 down here. And that's going to have the effect that traffic going to that prefix, um, because it's being announced this way, is probably more likely to come back down this way when packets are going to anything on this AS1's network here. And router B is advertising uh, 172.16.48 specific prefix slash 20, um, similarly up to this AS here, which when that gets you know passed up into uh, the upstream internet is more likely then to cause uh, packets to devices on that specific network to come down this way. But because the aggregate is also being um, advertised on both sides, and you know it's very important that um, you do own that aggregate here, like I say, then um, traffic to um, other subnets here, um, or uh, let's uh, not other subnets because there aren't any other subnets in this case, but traffic to, um, if one of these links should go down, then by advertising the aggregate on the other side, um, traffic can still get to these two subnets by either side should one of them break. So we've got redundancy and we've got some specific control here by advertising 
the aggregate and the more specific routes. Um, I wanted to show, however, um, how we can manipulate um, aggregate advertisement in the context of our demo environment here, where we're, what we're trying to do in this case is just ag ad advertise the aggregate to reduce the size of the routing tables in the peers that we're advertising our routes to. So if we look at the BGB table of router C, we can see that router C has these four 172.16 routes um, in the BGB table. The preferred route in each case, the one with the greater than sign to each of these prefixes is via 172.16.22, which is its peer down here. It prefers to use the path via its router A peer. The alternative route in each case is via the 172, sorry, the 192.168.6 path, which is router D. So router C can get to these prefixes in the BGB table preferred route, that's the one that's going into the routing table, but also it could go via router D to get down here. And in this case, those four prefixes are both being advertised by router A and router F. Okay, those prefixes are from these networks here that you can see one, two, three, four, and they're being advertised by router A and router F. If we, however, configure router A to only advertise the summary address, and we can do that with this statement here, with summary only, that's going to change things. If we now look at router, um, if we now look at router A's BGP table, we can see that router A is advertising the summary here. It's got a next stop of 0000, and it doesn't have any path because it's a locally generated route. And we see not only that, but we see these other options, these other more specific routes being suppressed in the BGB table of router A because uh, we've told router A to advertise these routes, but then we've got an overriding configuration statement that says, actually, I only want you to advertise the summary address. So the other routes now being suppressed from being advertised by router A. And that's what we see here. If, however, we go back to router C and look at the BGB table there, um, we can see the summary address via 192.168.6, which is across here, because the summary has gone from router A and it's gone to router F and then being advertised up here. That's the top route. And the preferred route, the one with the greater than sign uh, in router C, this one up here, for that um, summary prefix is 172.16.22 which of course is down here. So the preferred path is the one down here where router A is advertising that summary up. But we still see the more specific routes, those four more specific routes here in the BGB table of router C, because we've only asked router A to advertise the summary. So we haven't really achieved the goal of reducing the routing tables in the upstream routers. We've actually added a new route. We've got the original routes and we've got the new now summary route being advertised. So what will be sensible is if we go over to our router F, which is behind this capture here, and also apply our summary so that we um, can reduce those upstream received routes. And if we do that, if we apply the summary on both, both of our routers facing the upstream providers, and we go back to router C and have a look at the BGP table of router C again here now, we go and have a look at that prefix 172.16.00. 0, 0. 
The other more specific prefixes are no longer in the table because both A and F are suppressing the more specific roots. And let's have a look at C, which path has been chosen now. Uh, there's the path by 192.168.61, which is root of D. OK, there's this path over here. It doesn't have the greater than sign. It's got a path of two and three. So it was received, it was originated by three, it's gone through two. And so it's got, you know, a two hop AS path. And the other path, the one that is preferred, is the path by 172.16.22, which of course is the direct path down here to root array, which only has AS3 in the path. And therefore that is the one that's been chosen as the best. And that's the one that will go into the routing table of router C. So just some examples there of how we can do some path manipulation. Um, I wanted to sort of summarize everything, you know, help try to summarize what we've talked about today in these last two um, slides in this last section where we're trying to just sort of summarize the inbound and outbound process of um, the BGP routers and the selection process of uh, routes in the BGP table, and then subsequently the routing table as well. So first of all, if we look at the inbound process that we talked about here, um, uh, you know, ultimately the router invokes a decision-making process to select exactly one best route from the BGP table to be selected for going into the routing table. So um, when route advertisements are received uh, from routing updates from neighbors um, containing information about networking prefixes with AS paths, next hops, IP addresses, other route attributes, um, the import policy um, must apply um, to filter any unwanted incoming addresses, first of all. So Martians would include private addresses and other unregistered addresses um, from entering and potentially poisoning your routing table. You're also going to, of course, filter out any routes that have your own AS being advertised back to you because of um, you know, the looping mechanism here. And you're then going to potentially um, uh, alter the attributes of the incoming routes, like we saw, for example, with the local preference of routes being advertised because we want to prefer a particular outgoing path at the end of the day. Now, after we've done this, there's a, a validation process uh, where the BGP router validates routes based on AS path length, route origin, route, routing policies or whatever they are. And the router processes the updates and adds the valid routes to its BGP table. Uh, and that will of course include any withdrawn routes because updates includes withdrawals as well. And from that process, the routes will go into the BGP table as we've just seen. From there, there is a, um, a, a route selection or a best path selection process where the, the BGP router selects all the available routes um, uh, based on configured criteria such as shortest path, highest local preference, local lowest med, all the things that we just talked about and some others that we didn't have a chance to talk about selects the best paths and then installs those in the routing table. And then of course, when packets come along, it's the routing table, which is gonna be chosen to forward the packets. And then of course, the outbound process um, is what the router uses to export policies uh, and to manipulate attributes 
of its best routes when it passes them on to peers, when it's advertising routes to peers. Routes that are generated locally or routes that have been received have gone into the BGB table. And then there's a selection process that chooses the best paths. Obviously, local routes would be included in that. But from routes that have been received by other routers, the best paths will be selected to be then advertised on. BGB routers don't advertise everything on. So again, there's a route selection process from the BGB table to select um, the best routes to be advertised in the outbound direction. And again, these are going to be based on routing policies um, and the metrics, uh, the AS path metrics that we've seen in the BGB table. Um, remember, if the routes were locally generated, then we must have, um, I'm not sure if I pointed this out, but if you generate a route locally, then there must be an exact match for that route um, in the routing table already. So if you advertise a local route in BGP, then that route must be in the routing table. An exact match for that route must be in the routing table already. If it's a summary route that you're advertising, then a more specific route can be in the routing table um, uh, in order for the summary route to, to make it to the routing table. And then, of course, you've got these other metrics that determine which is the best route, um, and you will then pass those over to be, um, to be advertised. And then the route advertisement policies, um, again, can include manipulation. We saw some route maps where we manipulated routes in the outbound, in the outbound direction, uh, we didn't get a chance to talk about things like community strings, but we can tag routes with community strings to also influence um, the ASs um, and the routes that will be received from us when they get to um, the uh, ASs we're peering with. And of course, we've got outbound filters as well, where we can determine who would be, we should be sending routes to. Um, so, for example, here, I've shown an example of something uh, called an AS path filter. So if router A is advertising to this neighbor routes, then here we've got an AS path filter that says permit carrot and dollar. This is a, a regular expression. And what this basically means is that router A is only going to announce routes that were generated locally. So this, for example, might be something that an end user customer does uh, when it's announcing routes to an upstream service provider that's connected to. Um, if it doesn't want to be a transit, so it doesn't want to advertise routes that have been received from somewhere else and then re-advertise them out, um, an AS path filter like this means you're just going to advertise routes which are locally generated your routes for um, upstream uh, networks to get to your particular services. And of course, after all this is done, the updates are sent out to neighbors once the outbound process has been completed. And that brings us to, to the end of the presentation, in fact. So um, thank you very much. Um, were there any additional questions there, Holly? We do. So how can BGP routes be modified to change routing behaviour? OK, I think that must have come in a bit earlier. We, uh, I think we've seen some of those now. Uh, we've seen some techniques that can be used. So the administrator can go in and it can use these path attribute metrics like local preference, like MED, like AS prepend. Um, as well as some of the other ones that we mentioned, but I showed you examples of those, and those have a, you know an influence on um, the routes in the BGP table, and therefore the way that um, the metrics that are advertised on routes um, uh, that we advertise to peer autonomous systems. 
Um, okay, hopefully that question was, was kind of answered in the flow of the second part of the presentation there.